folks, welcome back to the Super Messy Workbench. I have something epic today. It is a vintage kit. It is an unboxing and a kit review, but it is special because I have what I believe is the worst flanker kit you can get your hands on. Um, so continuing everything I've been talking about with the petting zoo, um, I have, I have, uh, and uh, you know, all of these unboxings that I'm doing for, for the whole petting zoo project, you're probably going to see all out of order just as I get them um, unboxed and looked at and all that stuff and making different decisions. But I have mentioned this Ravel kit and I went to look for this kit. And so this ran me a big old grand total on, I mean, so the kit was open box, but everything is still sealed inside and everything. $4, $4 um, compared to some of the older kits on the market compared to some of the newer kits um, cost me three times the cost of the kit in shipping to get it here. Um, this is, uh, wow, this is something. So this was put out by Ravel in 1989. Now this is a reboxing with just different decals from an ACE kit in 1988. So while I am gonna show you that this is, in my opinion, an epically bad, horrific kit, we do have to give them a little bit of slack, gotta cut them a little bit of slack, because remember, this thing was just entering service. The West had not really seen this, this aircraft at all until, up close and personal, until 1989 at the Paris Air Show, um, where the Soviet Union sent a pair of flankers, 388, um, a Su-27S, and then uh, 389, a Su-27UB, to make the rounds and show off. Um, they were working entirely off of pictures and everything from that, but look look at that. Look at that, I mean, this is, it's awful. Um, but so, Ace put out their, their kit in 1988, um, Ravel licensed it, got the molds, whatever, reboxed it in 1989. And this is of course 172. You could see the box has, has plenty of, of wear, but inside our kit, is still perfect. Now, I remember this kit as, as being worse than it is, but it is still pretty bad. Um, in terms of, now when I say worst kit ever, we're gonna build this kit too, but I'm talking in terms of dimensions, in terms of looking like the real airplane, in terms of features of the airplane. Um, construction wise, you know, we'll see as it goes. But, um, I mean, just looking at the pieces, like we can tell this thing does not, it's not gonna look like a real flanker at all. And I might grab a modern flanker kit to compare some of it to as we go. I'm looking at that little tag, made in Korea. Um, we're gonna go through this kit. We're gonna look at everything. Um, and, and I'll show you how we know that this is based on very early pictures of a flanker rather than, um, you know, more modern stuff. There's a couple details that they didn't include in this that we can take a look at. So definitely older, older stuff. Now, interestingly enough, I remembered this having um, raised panel lines and everything. So it is cool that we have recessed panel lines and everything going on here. They are not representative at all of anything representing a real flanker, not even close. Um, in fact, some of the venting and everything is, I, I don't know. We've got all this detail here underneath the air brake, great. It's kind of made up, but it's just there. Same thing inside the landing gear bays here. Just just some stuff to represent stuff going on. Not necessarily re realistic at all. It is the worst representation of a Soviet ejection seat I've ever seen at all, but we'll get to that later too. So we've got three sprues and then clear parts, which of course they package in with all the other parts and look what all the rubbing, years of rubbing against all the other parts has done. We've got that big scratch there that we can take care of. Um, and oddly enough, which is really funny, the Erstis ball mounting is off to the side, which we wouldn't see as a feature until the Su-33 and later models of the flanker. It should be dead set in the center for what they're representing here. I don't even know why they would do this. That's so weird, but uh, much more bubbly canopy than, than the flanker would have anyway. Um, we've got folding wings. Maybe they were going for 
I don't know. I don't know because, again, we got wing folds that shouldn't exist at this point in history. Um, looking at the vertical stabilizers, which, again, the details just don't match anything for real. But, interestingly enough, they molded in the, the counterweights at the top, which were present only on very, very early models of the flanker. Um, before there was a split between the Su 27S and the Su 27P. You will, you will not see those on anything but the earliest production models of the flanker. Um, and the earliest pictures that were taken of the flanker when it was intercepting Norwegian and American naval aircraft um, over over the oceans. That's, that's where we first saw those. So that's kind of how you know that this kit is based on the earliest, earliest photographs of the flanker, not anything that we would see later on. Um, and that's something, you know, to note. We've got a very bulbous nose that is, again, not at all correct for a flanker. Flanker nose should be... Well, when you see it, you'll you'll immediately see what's wrong. Um, I'm just I'm just going and going and going. We'll go through the parts. Oh boy, we'll just go through the parts. Let's look at the instructions first. Let's take a look at the instructions. Um, so here we go. C27 flanker. Okay. Here are our decals. Now it's a 1989 kit. So I'm not gonna bash them too much for their decals, you know, virtually zero stenciling and just some board numbers and some red stars. And that's, uh, that's all you get. That's it. But surprisingly for the age of this kit, these look like they're in pretty good shape. If we bend it around a little bit, I don't see any cracking. I'm wondering if these would actually work. There's still a chance that we might put them in the water and they completely fall apart, but the decals look like they're in good shape for their age. I don't see yellowing. I don't, again, I don't see cracking on the carrier film or anything. I don't know. We'll try them out. We're not going to use them in any case. Um, or maybe we will. Maybe we'll build this exactly right out of the box and see how it turns out. Decals look like they're in pretty good shape, being from 1989. So let's see how many total steps we have here. Um, we have 19 steps, not including painting and all that stuff. Um, and it all starts with the cockpit floor and that control stick. And that really seems to be the cockpit there. Oh, no, we have an instrument panel. Okay. We have an instrument panel. Um, and that's it. That is your cockpit. Then <laughs> put the two halves together, um, which has some problems itself. Um, uh, you know, kudos to them for giving us single piece intakes at this early stage. Nice. Um, I have no idea how they're going to fit, but they give them to us. Um, and then we put these very inaccurately shaped wings together um, on both sides. We've got our ventral fins. We go straight in. I'm actually going to build this with landing gear. You know, we're going to, we're getting, again, straight out of the box. Okay. Very simplified landing gear, but it's there. Uh, landing gear doors. We're going to go to the nose wheel, which has our, our fog guard and everything. We've got IFF antenna, which is, you know what? That's interesting. That's a detail that, you know, honestly, I'm surprised they threw in on a kit of this, uh, I don't know, magnitude or lack thereof, but we've got an IFF antenna there. That's cool. Um, looks like we've got to cut apart the nose gears, but again, very simplified nose gear. Um, this right here would be appropriate for a MiG-29. MiG-29 has canted outward slightly vertical stabilizers, but the verts and the ventral fins on a Su-27 are both mounted vertical. So I'm not sure where that came from, and I'm not sure what this fairing is for. I have to check if the very early models had this fairing or not, or if that's just an extra part or whatever, but okay. We go straight into the radome. Did I miss putting together the ejection seat? Because the ejection seat is here. The ejection seat is here. Oh, I, you know what I did? I missed at the bottom of the page here. I'm sorry. Um, I was going across and I missed it. This is the ejection seat. Three pieces. I don't know what that represents at all. This is not a K36 ejection seat or anything like it. These are highly misshapen. They're not pods. They're launch rails. They're supposed to be launch rails. There are no wingtip pods available for this plane. But whatever. Wing pods. And okay. Cool. Cool. I, I got gotcha. you. An antenna, which is 
that's not the shape of antenna, but okay. And then we've got our windshield and our canopy. There are 21 steps in total, sorry. We've got missiles. Two of the most overly simplified AA-10 Alamo slash R-27s and the pylons that carry them. Just terrible. Terrible. This is the, the shape of the finished flanker. It looks somewhere between an early model flanker and the original T-10 prototype. And then here's the ordnance load, and we are we are missing we are missing hard points uh, on the outer wing, and we're missing hard points right there where you would actually send missiles, put missiles on a flanker. And then we've got our paint scheme, which is the old three-color flanker paint scheme, um, which seems to only have two colors on the top. I have no idea what this is supposed to be. Drag bomb. I never seen a flanker carry anything or any Russian aircraft carry a bomb that looks like that. I've seen some missiles that look like that, but not on a flanker. And of course they give us AA-8 aphids rather than the AA-11 archer, the R-73 it should, it should carry. And again, I don't know what this all represents, this panel lining, but it's uh, not a flanker. No sorry, Bob. I don't know. So getting back to the pieces. Um, again, I have no idea what these are actually supposed to represent. Not a clue. But we've got our 8s, which compared to the size of these 10s uh, are ridiculous. These are way too big or these are way too small. Take your pick. We can compare them to some Hasegawa ones, which are pretty good. And these are the Hasegawa ones right here compared to the... <laughs> to these Ravel ones, um, we're like missing almost half a missile here. That is ridiculous, um, completely ridiculous. If we look at the launch rails here for um, Ravel compared to the launch rails and Hasegawa, you can see that they are just, just completely wrong all the way around. Um, now, even looking, even looking at a short burn AA-10 in Hasegawa compared to these ones. Um, length is a little bit closer. It's still short, but just look at the difference in, in fin shape. More correct. Completely not correct. Completely not correct at all. Um, and the dimensions are just way, way off. I mean, way, way off. So don't even, yeah, don't even know what we're, what we're looking at when they made these or, or what these are. Here is a Hasegawa aphid compared to this Ravel one. And so the Ravel one is way too big. So it's a combination of both. The Ravel missiles are both too big and too small. Um, this Hasegawa one is much more accurate when compared with other ones. So, you know, I'm not sure what they were looking at or what they were thinking when they made these missiles. They just, they just made those missiles. Very simplified engine exhaust though. That'll work, that'll do it. Looking at an upper fuselage for Hasegawa, you can, I mean, look at these panel lines all the different panels, and then look at the Ravel one. You can see it's, I mean, it's just got, the shape generally is just wrong. And, I, you know, look at this stinger. This is what I'm saying. It's got a lot of features where they were looking, it looks like they were working off of a combination of the original T-10 prototype sketch and, and pictures that were taken, you know, over, from intercepts. Um, and just kind of put together this weird mishmash of of features of the plane. Um, and you know, if that works for him, okay. And I say Ravel because it's a Ravel kit. We're really talking about the, the Ace model because they made the molds. And looking at the bottom of the fuselage again, you can see different shapes in the landing gear well. Uh, different shapes of the landing gear doors that we'll eventually put in there and all sorts of stuff that's just all kinds of different um, from an actual flanker. So this model of the flanker that they put out never really existed. It's, it's just sort of there. It's almost like an artist conceptual sketch. Taking a look at wings of a production flanker versus their wings. Now, again, are they trying to do a Su-33 type deal here? Um, which, you know, I'm sure the, 
the Soviets were, were looking at, but I don't know why this would be here on this at all. Um, just very interesting that it's even included there. And a lot of details that just don't even... I don't know. I'm not even going to get into it. Once get vertical stabilizers, I'm not even I'm not even going to touch on. Um, they are just oversimplified, and again, they have that they have that old school, you know, shape. Take a look at a Hasegawa nose for a flanker versus this bulbousy thing for the Ravel kit. Um, this is what should be on the wings of the wingtips on of a flanker. Um, this missile rail right here, compared to these, they call them pods. We wouldn't see wingtip ECM pods for a while. Um, so there's just, you know, and that's as far as I'm going to go now. This is a, a terrible flanker kit. These auxiliary uh, air intakes there, way too big, way too long, uh, out, of, out of scale with the rest of the shape of the intakes. I mean, so that's why I am voting this as the worst flanker kit um, and uh, you know well and we already talked about this is just off and too bulbousy oh, yeah so you're getting you're getting kind of a little bit of one aircraft a little bit of another all smushed into one model kit here um, and then and then some folding wings that maybe came from a su-33 or not i don't know i couldn't tell you it is going to be interesting to build and put together. I don't anticipate the build taking too much time, depending on the fit of the parts, but we are going to build it exactly out of the box with kit instructions, with kit paint job, to see exactly what it looks like, according to Ravel. Um, so this should be quite interesting. Um, you see over here on the box art, they have painted the... The, um, the bare metal, the anti-heat plating. And on the model here, they just have it all painted all the way down to the to the engine exhaust. So, you know, whatever you want to do, Ravel. That's cool. They have no metal plating, bare metal for the gun here. I mean, it's just, it's a really interesting kit. I don't know. So I hope that you guys are as excited to see this build as I am to do this. This old, vintage, terrible flanker. Um, what do you guys think? Is there is there a kit that you would nominate for worst flanker kit out there in the world? Um, I'd, I'd really be curious to see what you would vote as your worst flanker kit. What else is is just worse in terms of... I'm not, again, I'm not talking about fit and finish. I'm talking about the worst example of a flanker ever put out on the market what do you got what do you got let's talk about it all right so oops we don't want to lose these precious decals so look forward to seeing this thing built in the near future i know i've got other projects going on but this looks like it'll take so little time i might squeeze it in between just so we can see it okay hope you'll join me for that guys for everybody out there in youtube land building your own projects keep building them build them well and I will be back again real soon with another unboxing project or how-to or something really soon. So I'll see you then.